Who puts help a rabbit? Like a, a, oh, apparently she's a rabbit lady. She was like, mm-hmm. I used to have a rabbit. I know how you did me. Contradictions. Listen to her. Oh my goodness. I used to have a pet hamster too. And All right. So let's see how this goes. Um, I'm going to be going through some slides, and um, fortunately, I'm going to be recording on that. that place over there, and that's kind of hard for me to actually move back and forth to advance the slides. So, so let me see if I can get that to you. All right, so do we have any questions to start out with? What should we talk about? Well, <laughs> hopefully you guys have started studying a little bit, right? No, I have time yeah. tomorrow. Due diligence. Uh, and the, the airplane doesn't work very well in this building. So. All right, so uh, we're just going to go through some slides, and we'll see if we'll, when we come to something interesting, we'll, we'll start talking about it. All right, you guys are pretty comfortable with the circulations, I assume. You're comfortable with EDD and ESD, right? Yes, okay. So, you know, if we think about that equation that we started working on to help us look at blood pressure, it was heart rate times EDV minus ESV and times resistance is equal to that delta P. EDV is how much blood is in the ventricle when it fills up, right? Um, And so, um, you know, if you think about factors that influence it, we're talking about things that change preload, right? ESV is how much blood is remaining in the ventricle after it contracts. And so we did talk a little bit about the concept of afterload would affect that. Because afterload is really a lot about resistance. And also the idea of contractility would affect it. Right, because if the heart contracts with more force, of course there's going to be less left over. So, um, you know, this equation that we're doing here is really meant to kind of just focus us on things that might change. Um, it's not really meant, I'm not going to be asked you, ask you to put in actual mathematical uh, numbers here, but it will help you look at the relationships. So if you can, you know, put in the fake numbers and kind of see what happens if something changes, that might be a helpful way to go. So the idea here, we'll, we'll build on this a little bit is that the whole idea of blood pressure, which is a major part of this test, is that we want to have a certain pressure to drive flow. There needs to be a certain pressure between the heart and the systemic capillaries to drive flow. That's why we're concerned about it at all. If for some reason the pressure goes down, the flow would go down. And what this equation is showing us is, let's let's say the pressure falls, well, what could we do to build up the pressure? Right, so if this pressure went down and the flow was not adequate, we could raise resistance. Or we could increase the heart rate. Or we could increase EDV. Right, or we could make ESV smaller. Right, that's the whole idea of this. Your book near the end of this chapter has a whole bunch of charts which are kind of doing the same thing. But this equation really has the same relationships in a much more compact form. Likewise, if the blood pressure goes up, and it's more pressure than we need to have flow occur, well, we could decrease the heart rate, we could decrease EDSV, we could increase ESV, we could decrease resistance. Okay, so that's really all, a lot of the stuff we talk about is somehow affecting one of these factors. Now, one key thing when we're talking about resistance here, and I don't think I made a big enough effort to explain this, is that that resistance is the peripheral resistance. Right, that's fighting flow from the heart. And it's really only found on the arterial side. Right, because it's really only on the arterial side that we care about blood pressure. 
right? Because we need the blood pressure to drive flow. Once we get to the far end of the capillaries, what do we use to drive blood pressure? Or to drive, to drive blood flow back to the heart? The muscular and respiratory. The muscular and respiratory pump, right? So again, uh, you know, the resistance doesn't really, we're only talking about arteries. Um, so this, all this stuff really doesn't apply there, okay? The venous return will affect preloads, so it could affect this part of the circuit, but the resistance there is not really all that important. <coughs> all right. Uh, you guys okay with cardiac output? Right? It's pretty simple. It's just how much blood is flowing to the system in a minute. It's what? How much blood is flowing through your system in a minute? So will you give us numbers and we'll do that? Uh, I should ask you to do that. Right, that's that's not a that, I, I potentially could ask you to do that, but that's really the only math. Are we going to have to memorize these formulas ourselves? No, they'll be on the they'll be on the test. Okay. Yes. It's the concepts are more important, mm -hmm. and how to apply them. Now, one thing that is kind of difficult is the idea of cardiac reserve, or it's, I don't think it's difficult, but it confuses people. So obviously, there's a maximum <coughs> flow that you could generate of blood. <coughs> Right? It would be at some combination of a really efficient stroke volume, a high stroke volume, and a high heart rate. That would be your maximum amount of flow that you could generate. At the same time, there's a minimum amount of flow that you need to live. The difference between those is the reserve. Right? It's the flow that you can generate beyond baseline levels that you could use to do anything. Right. Uh, you could also think about this is that, you know, there's a maximum amount of oxygen you could move around the body. That's the CO max. There's amount that you need of oxygen movement that you need to survive, right? Everything between them is oxygen movement that you could use and oxygen delivery that you could use to do anything, right? So that's the idea of the reserve. Um, you should know something about the resting heart rate. Um, really, this is just telling us that it decreases as we um, move from infancy to, you know, childhood and then adulthood. We talked a little bit about the fact that we often use 75 beats per minute or, you know, uh, as kind of a normal heart rate. That's kind of the average we use for just for ease of uh, illustration, really. But if the resting heart rate goes above 100 or below 60, or I should say, yeah, 60, we have special conditions, right? So too fast is what? Too slow. Okay. So you guys know that. Okay. Vagal tone. Is that okay? Some of this was actually on the last test as well. Right? What is vagal tone again? Well, vagal tone is referring to the fact that the vagal nerve is supplying acetylcholine, the parasympathetic nervous system constantly slowing down the heart rate when it's at rest, okay? And so as you start to increase the heart rate, the vagal tone goes away, and you add some sympathetic innervation, okay? <clears throat> All right. <coughs> so let's talk about the, okay. So when we're talking about this, preload is the amount of blood that comes back to the heart. The reason preload is important is because the more blood we put in the heart, there's more there is to pump out. Right? So and during rest, we can put more blood back in the heart. There's more to pump out. That's kind of obvious, but it's even more efficient than you might think because of that Frank Starling. What did the Frank Starling law tell us? Say what? So, essentially, it says that the more blood you put in during diastole, the more efficiently it will be ejected during systole. Okay, and so it's it's uh, it, the heart gets more efficient the more blood you jam into it, essentially. So it's more than just a simple math that, you know, you add more blood here and then there's less left over, or the same amount left over. It's that, no, you add more blood here and there's even less left over. So as the heart gets stretched, it becomes more efficient. 
and we're stretching the heart by putting blood in. So anything that we do to put more blood in increases preload, right? Increases this EDV. Anything that we do to take blood away decreases preload. So we're talking about things like losing blood or gaining blood or being dehydrated, right? Or rehydrating yourself. All will change preload. The muscular pump increases preload, right? The respiratory pump increases preload. So if you go for a run, your preload goes up just because the respiratory pump and muscular pump are working more often and working more efficiently, right? Contractility refers to what? Power of each contraction. Power of each contraction. And again, the, the preload kind of suggests that the heart, and Frank Starling Law suggests that uh, the heart does increase with pre, uh, force increases when we stretch it. With contractility, we're specifically referring to the amount of calcium in the muscle, right? So there's some overlap there because the Frank Starling Law may be actually about calcium, but it's not, not clear. Wait, that goes with contractility? So contractility is about calcium levels, so we're talking about epinephrine. It turns out that it may be that the reason that stretching the muscle increases increases efficiency may just be, may also be that calcium, but that's not for sure. Right? Your book does talk about several possibilities. So but when we talk about uh, norepinephrine only increases the heart rate, not the contractility. It does both. Okay. But because I remember reading somewhere that um, epinephrine increases both. Yeah, it's it's more important. So because when you release epinephrine, you also release some epin. When you release epinephrine, you also release some norepinephrine, which also increases contractility. But for our purposes, the speed of the heart is more important. The norepinephrine is more important. The epinephrine is more important for contractility. Okay. Afterload. This is the idea that if you have a lot of pressure out there in the system, that pressure is going to make it harder for the heart to pump out blood, right? Because you have to overcome that pressure for the valve to open. Right, the semilunar valve is open. And because the pressure is high, the semilunar valve is more likely to close quickly. You guys can look at your Wigger's diagram and see that would be the case. Okay? So afterload really is about peripheral resistance. Yes, Lorraine? Oh, I was going to ask, was afterload like the amount of blood you have to overcome? No, afterload is all the stuff that's pr pushing back against the pump. All right? So afterload would be, you know, you're pumping at your basement, and you're pumping out to the first floor. This is you're pumping out water, and you're carrying it up to the second floor. There's a higher afterload there. The pump is working against, against gravity more. So in this case, the afterload is caused by blood pressure. OK, we talked that we did that. We did that. There's the afterload. Again, if you watch, look at this diagram and think about how it affected the workers' chart, you'll see pretty quickly that it would change the stroke volume. Okay, um, the blood vessel layer, you guys, hopefully, these are pretty straightforward, so I'm not going to go into too much detail unless anybody has a question. Right. Okay, so here's something also that, that really messes people up. We have these vessels that have two names. Right? Elastic slash conducting, muscular slash distributing. The idea here is that they're named in two different ways. One, the first way is to say something about their histology or their construction. The second way is to say something about their function. So, for example, if we talk about these elastic arteries, they have a lot of elastin. They're very large. They experience a lot of pressure, so they have to give with that pressure. Right? And then they'll snap back when the pressure is relieved. That property of being able to stretch out with pressure and snap back was called what? Elasticity. Not elasticity. Wait, say it again. So the ability to be able to stretch and then snap back was called what? Compliance. Compliance. Right? Or distance ability, they're one spot. And well, the reason we're, we talk about that is that several systems have that. Okay. So that's their anatomical structure. 
when we talk about functionally, they're called conducting arteries because they are going to be able to move blood very quickly. They're very large, which means there's almost no resistance. So even though there's not much pressure change from the top to the bottom, from the heart all the way down to the abdominal aorta, or the bottom of the abdominal aorta, uh, that small pressure difference is going to drive a lot of blood flow almost instantaneously. Right? And so they're conducting blood down the core of the body very quickly. The muscular arteries are called muscular because of what? Yeah, there's a lot of smooth muscle, so they can change their diameter pretty, pretty well. Okay, so that's why they're called muscular arteries. They're called distributing arteries because they are the main artery that's distributing blood to various regions of the body. These are also the smallest named arteries as well. Okay, once we get past this, things are too small to name. Can you say that again? Um, that they're distributing blood to various regions of the body or various organs. So you'll talk about a renal artery or a popliteal artery, so like or a brachial ones. artery. They're, they're, they're main ones, and they're carrying blood to a particular region of the body or a particular organ. So they're distributing that blood. All right, there's our compliance disability. <coughs> we talked about that. It's what gives us our pressure say our pulse, arterioles, capillaries, right, we talk about continuous, sinusoidal, and fenestrated capillaries. You should be able to identify those three capillaries. Actually, we only did continuous there because I dropped the other two. Oh, well, that's all right. Because it didn't make a cut. Okay. So the capillary beds can be either closed or open. So on the test, I'll typically, you know, the test is in black and white, so if I do something like this, I'll say this is the red side or blue side. What we mean is the oxygenated or deoxygenated, right? And so um, this chart, you know, I could have it on the test, but I would have to tell you what the colors are. So just to keep in mind that we start off with a terminal arterial. And lines of something else, terminal arterial. And then on the other side we have what? Close capillary. Close capillary vein. Okay. So we're going to start out with a capillary bed that's closed. And what we mean by that is that we have all this shadowy area, and there's not going to be any blood flowing through that. Instead, we're just going to go from the terminal arterial to the postcapillary arterial very quickly, and we're going to do that through the vascular shunt. So that entire thing is the vascular shunt. There's sort of a halfway mark where we're in the arterial system, we're moving away from the heart, and then we start moving towards the heart. And so that divides us into the meta-arterial, and the thoroughfare channel, and then again, those two things together would be the vascular shunt. We're shunting blood away from the capillary bed from the terminal arterial to the post-capillary vein. Now, if we open that up, right, what's going to happen is we have some pre-capillary sphincters, a little smooth bits of, bits of smooth muscle that can open up and let blood flow into that wider bed, which is that yellow color. Okay? So the pre-capillary sphincters are controlling that movement. This wider bed is called blood. True capillaries. So, again, one of the things we discussed, why would those pre-capillary sphincters open up? They need blood to that area. They need blood to that area. How are they going to know that they need blood to that area? 
local factors, right? They're not, again, the whole idea is this is too small for us to have nerves, so we're going to use local factors to tell us that we need blood. So what's, what's an example of something that, a local factor that would be <coughs> involved here potentially? Oxygen, right? So should oxygen levels be high or low for them to open? Low, because that would tell us if there was low oxygen, that would suggest that we need blood flow. And the precapillary sphincters will open up under low oxygen conditions. That's those little circle dot things. Yeah, like the little wormy looking things here. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, what else besides low oxygen? CO2. 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 It should be high or low? High. Uh, yeah, so high CO2, okay? Um, low pH, right? There's other things that would happen typically involved with <coughs> metabolism. So, uh, low glucose would be something else. You have low blood, blood, blood <coughs> glucose in the area, they'd be like, wait, where did all that glucose go? Well, the cells were using it, so that's why it's low. Okay? So a lot of different things that would be local factors, but you should know is oxygen and CO2. And it makes sense that that would happen. If oxygen levels are high and CO2 levels are low, that suggests that the tissue does not need blood. And so the precapillary sphincters will contract, right, blocking flow into the true capillary. All right, there's our veins. What's one major difference between a vein and an artery? Veins have um, veins are the valves. The direction it's going from the heart. So it's going back to the heart. Veins have valves. So we have two different valves. See, somebody said veins have valves, and somebody said they don't. They do. Okay, they have valves. All right. Do all of them have valves? No. No. So if you get if they get big enough, if they're going back towards you know, once we get towards the, you know, the, the iliac, common iliac veins, for example, right, essentially this stuff and this stuff and that stuff, there's no valves there. <coughs> All right. Now, so because... The big, wait, the big veins have... have the big veins do not have valves. Big veins don't. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so what's happening is, though, that every time we move, we're cinching up around the vein, blood's pushed up, and then when the muscle relaxes, it can't go backwards because of the valve. That's driving blood from the limbs back towards the core. And then once we get to the core here, right, we can either use gravity or what's the other pump that would be used to get blood from the limbs back Respiratory. up? Respiratory. Respiratory pump, right? So every time you breathe, when you breathe, uh, when you breathe the downwards, your diaphragm goes down, there's a high pressure area in your abdominal cavity that's low in your thoracic cavity, and so blood shoots up towards the heart. Okay. So again, we're using pump, pumping action to move blood back towards the heart. Remember that we're spending more time in the venous return than we are in the arterial system. Especially if you're at rest, like 60% of 65% of your blood is in your veins rather than your arteries, because it's moving back more slowly than it would go out, out toward, away from the heart. Okay. You should know that we measure things in millimeters of mercury. Right? That's generally true for all the stuff that we're talking about from here on out. So partial pressures like gases, which we'll talk about tomorrow, measured in millimeters of mercury. Pressure here in the blood, millimeters of mercury, and so forth. Um, systolic and diastolic. Now let's talk a little bit about resistance. All right, so let's talk about things that change resistance. So first of all, resistance should go up or down if a vessel gets smaller. Up, down. Yeah. Resistance goes up. Resistance goes up, right? So if a vessel gets smaller, that's vasoconstriction. Resistance goes up, and the flow would go down unless we use more pressure, okay? If the vessel gets bigger, Vasodilation, 
resistance goes down, flow would go up. Okay. Now, uh, one of the key things about this is the concept of laminar flow and the fourth power rule. Okay. I don't think I'm going to put the equation for the fourth power rule on the test because I think you guys should be able to know that. Right? What does the fourth power rule say? Yeah, so resistance <coughs> changes, and so I'm going to use that little proportional sign, but we could also use equal, depending on the fourth power of the radius. And so what that means is that changing the radius of a vessel a little bit has a very big change on its resistance, and hence has a very big change on the flow. Now, um, we talked about, and so this is happening all the time. Uh, depending on the size of the vessel, we could do it with um, nervous, t nervous uh, signals. If things get smaller, we're doing it with local factors to some extent. Vasoconstriction, vasodilation, we talked about when we have um, a cut, <coughs> vasoconstriction, right? But we did talk about some things that globally cause vasoconstriction. Our vaso, our globally caused vasodilation. What were those? What were the hormones that we talked about that change, for example, cause the vessels everywhere to sort of cinch up? What? Uh, not quite yet. You're a little bit ahead of it. Eventually, that would come into play. Not any. Well, that's that's a that's a um, it is a hormone, but it's also a neurotransmitter. So it's used as a neurotransmitter in this case. Yeah, if you did, so actually, you're right. So if you had any, actually, any is a little bit complicated, right? We'll put that as a question mark in a second. We'll discuss it. But one that's basically globally pretty easy to understand going to cause constriction. The na it's in the name. Megan's almost on it. She's on it, but it, it affects those hormones. Angiotensin II causes basically global vasoconstriction, and so the one that causes vasodilation was dang it, dang it. okay. So norepinephrine is a little more complicated, right? So first of all, we did mention that it's used to to, to actually uh, neuronally to activate smooth muscles, so it's coming from nerves, but you can also release it into the blood supply, but it has two effects. So, for example, it causes both vasoconstriction and vasodilation. So, it causes vasodilation to cardiac and skeletal muscle, causes vasoconstriction to muscle that's, uh, I should say, that's smooth, the vessel, and smooth vessels that are carrying blood to, like, your kidney, your, your heart, uh, not your heart, uh, your stomach, or something like that, okay? So, it's a little more complicated. These are basically globally significant. So, let's talk about A and P. Where is this release from? Atrial natriuretic peptide. Where do we release this from? Yeah. Atrial myocytes. Okay. Released by atrial myocytes, again, travels everywhere, causes vasodilation, so blood pressure would go down. So, again, this is released if the atrial myocytes are you know, experiencing high blood pressure, they, and they release a little bit of ANP, okay? Um, and so then that's going to cause vasodilation. If you go back to that equation, that would cause the blood pressure to go down a little bit. Angiotensin II, we talked about it has this complicated mechanism where um, essentially renin is released, which goes through several steps to cause angiotensin II levels to be released. Where was renin released? The kidneys. Right, so the kidneys are detecting pressure. Okay, so that's the first step. Now, the other thing that will happen, though, and we'll, we'll erase this real quick, is that both these hormones also have long-term effects. Right? Let's take angiotensin II to start off with. Angiotensin II not only causes this vasoconstriction, it also 
causes increased aldosterone. What does aldosterone do? Hmm? I gotta look it up. This is where I showed the picture of the bodybuilder's butt cheeks. <laughs> right? Uh, it causes <laughs> the muscle cell strength. Yeah. Well, yeah, and what was the point of that whole thing other than the salt? Like the salt? Salt moves. Salt moves, yeah. Where okay, so where's the sodium? So the water is. Water so follows salt. Water follows salt. Okay, so where is the salt gonna go in this case? <laughs> Where the water goes? Yeah, where's the salt? Yes, but why, where we, we're preferentially pulling salt from one point to the other. Right? We're talking about you're going to pee. Salt that would have gone out in the urine is instead going back to the blood. Yeah, it's like a reuptake of the salt. Yeah, so salt is in the blood. And that means water goes into the That's blood. That's what aldosterone does? That's what aldosterone does. Yeah. So, again, this would be, you know, let's say you're dehydrated, your blood pressure is falling, um, you'll, your angiotensin 2 would be increased. <coughs> the next time you, you start drinking some water, um, you're going to start peeing out less because you're going to be retaining salt in the, in the body and the blood volumes, the water's going to follow the blood volumes to start going. So that means EMP is pretty easy to understand. It blocks aldosterone. So we constantly have a little bit of aldosterone around, but we're blocking that. So the sodium that would have gone into the blood under normal conditions is going into the urine. Water goes into the urine. And so blood volume falls, right? Here, there's less the plasma, there's less volume there, okay? All right, so wrist resistance, vessel diameter, this is changing all the time, so it's, you know, again, this is the major way we control blood pressure is changing <coughs> vessels, diameter. What else changes resistance? These are longer term things. Turbulence increases resistance, right? Length of the vessel. So we talked about why obesity would change resistance because the vessels have to get longer. Viscosity. And viscosity, okay? So, um, you know, if we think about that equation again, And we can think about dehydration as an example of several different things happening. <clears throat> and we have dehydration occur. So first of all, the blood volumes go down in dehydration. So what would happen to preload? Preload? Mm-hmm. So you're, you're dehydrated, so you're out in the sun all day, you don't drink any water, your blood volume's going to go down. Basically, water's going to leave the plasma and go into your cells, okay? Your preload decreases, right? There's less blood to come back to the heart. So which one of these values would change? EDV, okay. So preload with dehydration is going to be less, okay? Um, what happens to resistance? So this is a little tricky. All right, this is actually one of the few cases where your blood is actually more viscous than it would normally be. All right, if you take out water out of the plasma, while well, all the cells are still there, the hormones are still there, the peptides are still there, the formed elements are still there, the blood gets more viscous, right? So resistance would go up a little bit, but the preload effect is bigger than the viscosity effect. Okay, so that's an example of something. 
Um, the other thing that we talked about a little bit, and I was talking to someone to visit my office today, and we were discussing this, is what happens when we have anaphylactic or septic shock? Right? Uh, what happens when we have anaphylactic or septic shock? What area of the vascular system is affected? That we talked about. Is it arteries or veins? Veins. veins. Okay, so the veins open up. And so <coughs> blood is sort of stuck in the veins. Now, a key thing is that's really not changing this resistance. Because this equation is all about using pressure to drive flow. Right? And so this equation really only deals with blood pressure, which only deals with the arterial system. So the resistance isn't really changing there. It's changing in this other system, which uses what to drive flow? What were the things that you... The pumps, right? Muscular, yeah. muscular, muscular. And, and muscular pumps. So those are still going. However, if blood is harder, is stuck in the veins, it would affect EDP. So preload them. Those are pumps. Okay. All right, you should know about the baroreceptors. We talked about the aortic arch has receptors, the carotid sinus has receptors. Which one of these is most most crucial? If they disagree, which one would win an argument about what blood pressure should be like? The carotid. The carotid. Okay. The syncope is what? It's balanced. Huh? What? Not balanced. I think you had it. Did you get it? No, it's passing, it's out, passing yeah. out or fainting, okay. So you want to avoid that. So the carotid sinus reflex and measuring the blood pressure makes it so that there's enough blood pressure so that we don't pass out. Okay, so if the blood flow to the body is fine, but there's not enough pressure to drive flow to the brain, we'll increase the pressure to the entire body just to make sure we get blood to the brain. Um, so again, there's the norepinephrine we talked about has these sort of contrary things going on, vasodilation and vasoconstriction. We talked about AMP, angiotensin 2, right. and again, there's a lot of stuff on this slide, but what I want you to know is renin is released it leads to angiotensin 2. So what's the point of angiotensin 1? Is it just a precursor to 2? It's a good question. I'm assuming it does something, but I'm not sure what, why it's such a complicated mechanism. It is a weird mechanism. Um, but it doesn't do anything distinct from 2. No, I don't, well, I don't know. That's a good question. I need to look into it. I've not seen anything about it. I would be surprised if it didn't. So I suspect what's going on is that this angiotensin 1 does something, and then you're controlling this converting enzyme to decide whether you go to 2 or not. But I don't know if it's that well understood. Okay. Hypotension, hypertension, okay. The lung anatomy, apex and base, parietal, pleura, pleural cavity, visceral pleura. Same terms as pericardium, but we're just calling these pleura now. Same kind of decay, same concept. Okay, um, inspiration, expiration, and what happens. So first, let's do our little chart. Um, as you might imagine, this is something that's extremely likely to be on the test, where we had that chart where you're putting in volumes of breathing, right? It looks something like this. Uh, let's go back to normal, right? Something like that. You guys remember that? Okay. So a few things that people often get wrong is, first of all, this measurement from here to here is what? Tidal volume. Tidal volume, right? And so sometimes that is called 
titled breathing because of that. It's also the type of breathing we have with quiet inspiration and quiet expiration. Okay. The next one we want to talk about is inspiratory reserve vol volume. <coughs> so inspiration is breathing in or out. Which one is it? And so the volume should go up. So obviously we're going to put a mark here. The question is where should I put the second mark? Top of the title. Okay. A lot of people do put it down here. But tidal volume and IRV do not overlap. Right? If we want to measure ERV, expiratory reserve volumes, how much more can we push out? We measure from here to the bottom. Okay. No overlap between ERV and TV, which is the reason if I want to calculate the vital lung capacity, it's from here all the way down to the bottom. And so that includes IRV plus TV plus ERV, right? Because they're each separate bands. And so to get that whole thing, you have to add all three together. What was the other capacity that we talked about? Well, we did talk about that. We'll get that in a second. What's the other one that was we could do on this chart? Tender loving care. Total lung, total lung capacity. TLC. All right. Uh, and that includes all the way down to, you know, basically the bottom of the lungs, right? Where the lungs would be flat like a pancake. What is BLC? Vital lung capacity. It's how much air is moving in and out of the lungs when you're breathing in and out as deeply as possible. Okay. And then the total would include the area that never, the air never leaves it, right? There, when, you, when you breathe out, there's still some air down there. Um, it also includes the, the fact there's space taken up by anatomical structures. So when we talked about the bronchi and the bronchioles, they take up space. So it accounts for that as well. Okay. So let's talk about force vital capacity. So this one, again, it, it's, it's, it's very similar to vital capacity, but it's, it's, a, um, it's a test, right? So it's, it's forced, a forced test, where I just have you establish breathing, and then I have you breathe in as much as possible, and then breathe out quickly as you can, okay? So it's not going to be exactly the same as the vital lung capacity. In fact, it's going to be smaller. From here to here, it is going to be smaller because this is not a typical circumstance, right? Typically, when you're breathing heavily, you build up to it and it gets more efficient. But here, we're doing it in a testing situation. <coughs> so from here to there, is the force vital capacity. Now, one of the things we talked about is you often want to know, well, how much air came out in a period of time, right? So if, I, if you start breathing out here, I could ask, well, how much air left after one second? That would be FEV1, right, which is force expiratory volume 1. And then I could say, well, how much left after two seconds? That is FEV2, okay? Now, why do I care about that? Why, why do we do this test at all? Yeah, that's one thing, but what else would we be concerned about? Because it turns out that the shape of this actually matters, right? The fat FEV1, if we just concerned about lung capacity, we wouldn't really care about FEV1, right? Disorders. So what were the two different types of disorders we could test for? Yeah, obstructive and restrictive. So, so the key here is that in an obstructive disorder, there's no change in the force vital capacity. What changes? is FEV. 
we're going to be posting this, so watch your language. Uh, <laughs> i got to constantly watch it. All right, so what's going to happen is that, you know, you're going to be breathing in and out, and then I ask you to breathe. Uh, it's going to take it longer to get to the top, right, and it's going to take longer to move out, okay? So if we look at the percentage that left in one second, it's less, right? Normal might be 80%, that's kind of considered the norm, but let's say you have obstructive and only 60% of the volume leaves after a second. Well, that means there's something blocking air movement in and out. The volumes haven't changed any, but it's just harder to move air in and out, right? And so you'd have this particular form. The restrictive disorder, <coughs> there's no change in how quickly air moves in and out. It's just the lung capacities have changed. Right, and again, we're comparing you to a norm. And so what happens is you don't get quite as high as you normally would. And you don't get quite as low, but the chart looks a lot the same as far as the volume of air moving out as a percentage is, is fine. You're still getting rid of 80% in a second, but you didn't actually bring in as much air into the lungs as you normally would, right? And not as much air is leaving. So that restrictive... The way you think about it is you're restricting the volume of the lungs some way. You're restricting the capacity of the lungs. And so really what we're talking about is a change in compliance. Of the ribs or lungs. Right, and so again, I think the, the slide calls it the stretchiness. Right. Your ribs are supposed to be kind of like a nice rubber band that you can pull on, the lungs pull out, and then when the lungs relax, the lungs are kind of like a rubber band that snaps back and they collapse, but that can go away, right? And we have some examples of that with fibrosis, for example, scar tissue in the lungs or the rib cage becoming ossified, the cartilage of the rib cage becoming ossified, or your muscles are weak so you can't pull open the rib cage like you used to, okay? So, you know, you should know a little bit about some of the muscles that are used in inspiration, expiration. I don't expect you to know them all, but you should know if there's more muscle involved in forced inspiration, forced expiration. Um, you should know the external intercostals, internal intercostals, right? External is pulling the rib cage out, internal is pulling it in. The internal intercostals really aren't active during quiet expiration. They only come into play during forced expiration. So when the lungs get bigger, why does ventilation increase? So if I'm breathing quietly and I take a deep breath, my lungs are getting bigger and more air moved in. Why did that happen? more space was created. Okay, so I start. The lungs, there's more space in the lungs, the more volume happens, the volume increases. What does that do to the pressure in the lungs? <coughs> Decreased pressure. Decreased pressure in the lungs. The air is still at the same pressure. So we've created a bigger differential between what's the pressure out here in the environment and the pressure in the lungs, so air moves in. Okay? If you breathe out with a lot of force, well, I'm making the lungs smaller. The pressure builds up. Now the high pressure is in the lungs. There's low pressure right here, so air moves out. Right? That's really all there is to lungs. It's like a bellows, like you use to, you know, um, to do blacksmith or like if you know if you have somebody's um, fireplace in someone's home, you have a bellows. When I was a kid, we used to, my grandma would always like try to squirt each other in the bellows. Right? Uh, same idea. That's just it's the same principle. That's what's going on in the bellows. The volume is changing, pressures are changing, and so airflow is changing. Right? Let's see if we got anything else. We do. So, we got any general questions while we're consider chatting? I think that's pretty much. Okay, well, you guys are, are you okay with this? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, really, it's just the trachea goes into the bronchi, and then you got things that are going to lobes, and you got things that are going to segments, and then the smallest things are the terminal bronchioles. Is there, in this whole thing, it's called the conducting zone, is there any respiration going on here? <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. Is 
Say that again? This whole thing that we're talking about is a conducting zone. Is there any respiration going on in the conducting zone? Mm -hmm. No, not even in the thermal bronchi. No. no it's, in the the, the, yeah. it's in the respiratory bronchi, right? In order to have gas exchange, which we'll start talking about tomorrow, you need these alveoli. Alveoli, sorry. Uh, and each one is an alveolus, right? And then you say so this tube is a this is a respiratory bronchial. It's like a tube, but it still has some alveoli on the outside. There's a smooth muscle. We'll talk about them a little bit later tomorrow. Pulmonary capillaries, alveolar sac. Okay. So now we're in the respiratory zone where we can actually have gas exchange occurring. And for some reason, I left off the fact that this is called external respiration. That will be on the next test, right? Um, that's what's going to happen here: external respiration. Gas exchange out there between the lungs and the blood and the pulmonary capillaries. Okay, any questions? All right, well, have a good evening. If anybody thinks of any questions, we can you know, ask them at the beginning of class tomorrow. And uh, I'll be around tomorrow afternoon, I think, some a little bit. Test is on Monday. Test is on Monday. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Right,